here came 2020. And we're in the 19th chapter of Genesis. We stopped on last week with verse 30. We start tonight with verse 31. We see the back sliding faith and the dead faith of Lot and the, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah because of the sin and the lifestyle that they were living. We see that when we have backsliding faith or dead faith, we notice that that faith don't have any bearing on those around us, including our family. This is why it's so important for us to keep our light on. But with that being said, we stopped on last week with verse 30, just to do a real quick recap of verse 30, and then we're going to verse 31. It says, And Lot went up out of God, and dwelt in the mountain, and his two dogs with him, for he feared to dwell in Zor, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two dogs. Well, we noticed that when God sent an angel down there, the angel told him, told him, them in the first place to go to the mountain. Well, for some reason, Lot asked the Lord to allow him to go to Zerg. But we noticed that what God told him to do in the beginning, that's what he got to do now anyway. So uh, with that being said, him and his daughters and went into the mountain. We'll start with verse 31 tonight. But let's, uh, let's just try 31. Through 36 together because they're going to kind of run consecutive. When the firstborn said unto the young, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve the seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine at night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father. And he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesterday with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also. And you go in and lie with him, that he may preserve the seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him. And he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. Thus were daughters, thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. That sounds pretty lovely. And I know we're gonna look up on that again. A low thing and it is. But it also shows us the environment that people are brought up in. And your environment mm -hmm. has a lot to do with the way that you think. Your environment has a lot to do with what you do in life. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at this, we also need to look at the environment that she was in. Although her dad was a, a believer, but his faith was dead. There was a bad influence upon children. This is a shameful scene, but it shows the most tragic reason of a backsliding life and often effect backsliding has upon children. Lot's two dogs were living in the cave out in the middle of the mountain, began to worry if they would ever marry or bat children. Thus they plotted the most immoral scene in Madden to get their father drunk. Have they were worried until this event. He had given them some moral training in verse 8, but he had reared them in a worldly and wicked environment in a social atmosphere of a city official that no doubt included drunkenness, dancing, and other activities that led to loose behavior. Lot himself apparently had loose morals, for there was only one place the daughters could have gotten wine to make their father drunk from him. He must have bought the wine out of Sodom when he fled the city. Imagine fleeing for your life and being able to save only what you can carry on your back and choosing wine to be one of the few items 
you say. Lot's backsliding state was severe indeed. The example he had set before his family through the years was a sorrow. Pitiful example. No one these two young women went astray. All they had ever seen, despite some moral teaching, was an environment that allowed loose living that was socially acceptable to the higher society of businesses and government leaders. The parties and gatherings that they were so familiar with, that their father and their dad and their mom was attending, were not the places, not the things to do with your child or your children. And we look at what they did, but we also need to look at the environment that they did it in. You see, children don't always see everything of a parent because a parent has lived a life before the children ever was born. And sometimes when children, when they are born, it has a tendency to change a person. In other words, they might not ever see who their dad or their mother would be they were born. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because this might have been what happened with Lot and his children that after he married his children never saw the lifestyle that he was leading when he was with Abraham. Remember Abraham was the one who taught him about God. But remember now Lot was the one that left Abraham and moved towards Sodom. So his children were living in Sodom. It's just like children are today. When you have children that's adopted into a family where it's two men in that family raising them, or it's two women, and I'm not talking about two sisters or two brothers. I'm talking about two men that want to be a, a couple, or two women that want to be a couple. <laughs> children that grow up in this environment, they're going to take on that character because they start to think, that where they are and what they are going through, this is what's supposed to happen. And so these children, these girls, had seen so much stuff going on in Solomon and Moore. You see, sometimes you can say, well, I'm all right. But what about your children? You know, we talked, uh, we had a good man being said, and I even brought it up uh, Sunday. Look at our environment. I want you to think about something. And we said it Sunday. It's seven days in a week. It's 24 hours in a day. When you calculate seven times 24, you come up with 168 hours. In a week, those of us that are, are, are die hard, you know, when, when the door over we're there, we spend about four hours out of 168 hours in the house, receiving the word to grow in the Lord. Now, what we spend outside of it when we're at church, how much we spend time meditating or praying, or how much time we spend studying the word, that's something different. But I'm talking about the time that we spend in church. Now, look at our children. Those that we bring our children every time, every Sunday morning, they're here for Sunday school. They're here for morning worship. We're talking about about three hours. They're here for Bible study. That's another hour. Well, how long do they be in school? in a week. Every morning they had school from what, 8 to 3? We're going to just say 7 hours. But if you calculate 7 times 5, that's 35. So they got 35 hours there in school around other children that might not know who God is. How easy is it for them to start picking up some of the character of those that's around them that's telling them, oh, that's all right. Oh, everybody else is done. Oh, do you want to be a part of the clique that we're in? Oh, do you want to be accepted? So our children sometimes start to give in to those things because they're in that environment. So this is why it's so important for us. When we're at home, we need to be a good example to our children because they need a little bit of extra support as far as seeing. I'm not talking about just talking about it, but seeing what righteousness is. So these children spent seven days a week right there living in Sodom and Gomorrah. They could look out there one. It wasn't nothing for them to see me in here. Mm -hmm. They could look out there one. They could walk down the street 
it wasn't nothing for them to see things that children shouldn't have been able to see. Mm. Well, the thing about it is, they start to pick up these things. This is why they did what they did. Remember what Jesus said on the cross about us. He said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. do. People who have not been taught any better, we expect for them to do better sometimes because of their age. But what do age have to do with it if you have not been taught? You can be 60 years old and nobody taught, taught you that you're not supposed to steal. Guess what? You're going to be a 60 year old thief. Because you think that wasn't right. Nobody never taught you. The children didn't get what Lot got. Lot got it from Abram. And he left Abram and got the children out from around Abram. We know that just. Just back up in the same chapter when the angel told Lot, said, go get your family and get them out of this place. You remember he went to the son-in-law, he went to the other daughters, they laughed at him. Why is that? Because here it is, you come in here not telling us God finna destroy us. And no telling what he had been doing to being a man that we, they done seen him do. Now we done seen you do this, now you gonna come telling me about God. So because his testimony was dead because his faith was dead. And James said, faith without works is dead. The reason it's dead because we're not showing no proof whatsoever that we've been saved. Yeah, we didn't go on a corner. Oh, I believe God died for my sin. He said, you truly believe it? You confess that? He said, you shall be saved. But along with being saved, there should be some fruit to go along with. When there is no fruit to go along with dead faith, you look at this gentleman right here because he's going to be a prime example of what happened when we have dead faith. But why did he have dead faith? He was running behind the world and the things of the world. That's why he moved us up. He was a businessman. He could make money there. But it draw him right on in town. And by drawing me, and yes, he was making money, but you're losing your family. And at the end of everything, the very thing he was running behind, he lost it all. Everything he ran behind, he lost it. Right now, life is broke and living in a cave. Everything he had has been destroyed. It should be an example to us also. The letter of thought. No matter how we run behind a dollar bill, no matter how we run behind the things of the world, do you know how long it takes for it to be gone? Bam! Just like that. And you have spent a lifetime running behind, trying to get it. That's what Lot did. And then at the end of it, you ain't got nothing. Without God, we have nothing. God will let us go on and forget him. He'll let us go on and run behind. But now at the end of everything, what can we get with? So when we look at Lot's children, and we look at what they did, we got to also look at the environment that they lived. And you know, the scripture ain't telling us all the things that they done seen their daddy do while he was there in Sodom and Gomorrah. Because I'm quite sure he did some stuff. You know why he did? Because he had to go along to keep his position. He had to go along to, to, to keep his position, to keep his power, to keep being looked up to, to keep making money. So guess what? He compromised. The thing with compromising is, is that you'll start compromising a little bit. The scripture says the little fox that tear the vine. You see, we start off with a little bit, but before you know it, it's a whole lot. What is it for a man to gain? The whole world loses his soul. But in, in any question that we look down that verse. You know, Pastor, it, it kind of makes me think back to when Abraham and Lot separated themselves. And Lot tried to, you know, basically tried to kind of hustle things to get 
to come out of here. Mm -hmm. And he had that whole muscle mentality in his mind. And it became, he became so consumed with it. But God brought him right back to the place where, 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 where he needed him again. He was there alone in the cave. Now he would have a chance to, you know, he had a chance to repent in that cave. But we don't know if he ever did that. I'm okay. He, he had to. I feel like he had to. Because he, he kind of fell off the map there, didn't he? I'm going to tell you, Pastor. That's going to be the last time we talk about that. But yeah. But I, what I want us to see, and we don't get nothing in the things that we run behind and we compromise <clears throat> putting God separate. We can get all of them things and it be gone just like that. Mm -hmm. Listen, look at people. Just say those that's out in California where well, the five had come. You had rich people. I'm talking about some filthy rich folks. God took them and brought them all, all the way down from the rich and put them right over in there sleeping on a cot and eating with the folks. Mm -hmm. And you know what they said? I lost Is some catastrophic thing, even with us today. And some are going to say, I don't know what's going to happen in here, but we're going to have some things to happen in here. It's going to be pretty significant to us. It's going to try our faith too. But we got to keep our eye on the Lord. We got to plant our faith in the Lord. Remember what he said. He said, whatsoever a man sow, that shall he reap. If we sow into Christ, we're going to reap in Christ. If we sow into God, we're going to reap from God. When we sow into the Word, we're going to reap of the Word. But we have to keep in mind now, the world is going to pass away. And everything in it. And when we are sowing into it, we are sowing into death by ourselves. Because we're sowing into death. If we sow into God, we're going to reap in God. Is there any other question coming? If not, we'll finish them last two verses, and then we're going to try to bring everything about a lot together. And the firstborn bore a son, and called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger she also bore a son and called his name Ben Ami. The same is the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. Now we come out they don't now <laughs> what should these children call that? Like? Dad or granddad? Are they grandchildren? So which one of those would actually now think about what I'm saying. Should they call to the children and say dad? Or should they say granddad? Either way they go, we see that incest ain't good. Now, what I want to point out with this, this is one of the reasons that a person don't need to get drunk. Now, if you ever want to see uh, boundaries and everything that go out the door. Mm -hmm. Let a person get drunk. Mm -hmm. Once he get drunk, I don't care. It don't matter. Because he drunk. I want us to think about something. I don't know if you pay attention. We used to call the liquor store, the liquor store, the ABC store. Do you know what they call them now? They named them wine and spirits. <laughs> Some say beer, wine, and spirits. Why would they call them spirits? Because that's what they are. They just in a bottle. If you want to see a person change, get that alcohol inside of him, and you will see a different person. And all of a sudden, the bounds that you used to have, they just lose. Why? Because there's another spirit that's controlling your mind and your body. 
This is why they call them spirits. Both of these nations were to be bitter enemies and oppose Israel, the followers of God, in future generations. They eventually, down through the ages, intermixed with the Arabs, as did many of the people throughout the Middle East region. But the Amorites and the Moabites people, they was always looked down on. But God, he's so loving and merciful. He even took a Moabite woman Ruth. and used her Ruth. to be in the genealogy of Christ. You know what he's telling us? He's actually telling us that no matter where you come from, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've done, no matter what your last name is, there's room for you if you repent. That's what God is letting us know. But now Lot, backslide. We're going to note these facts about Lot's journey of backsliding. We're going to start. He started out with the same heritage and environment as Abraham did, with the same opportunity as Abraham did. We'll see that in Genesis 11, 27, and in the, uh, uh, the 12th chapter, 1 through 4. He was a believer, a righteous man, the same as Abraham was. Genesis 15, 6, but also 2 Peter 2 and 7. He, he he followed Abraham, the example of a righteous, a righteous for a while, Genesis 12, 1 through 4. He moved among and joined the world in Genesis 13, 12 and 13, and chapter 14. He refused to heed the warning and deliverance of God, refused to break from the world in Genesis 14, 11 through 24. He allowed his faith to be degenerated to become kind. He acted selfishly, Genesis 15, uh, 13, 5. He looked toward worldliness, Genesis 13, 10, 11. He moved among and joined the world, Genesis 13, 12, and 13, and 14, 11, and 12. He refused to heed the warning and deliverance of God. He refused to break from the world in Genesis 11, 14, 11 through 24. He lacked the courage to break away from the world. He suffered a vast spirit because of evil surroundings, 2 Peter 2 and 8. He rebuked and attended, attempted to correct evil, Genesis 19, 1 through 3 and 6 through 9. And he still hesitated and refused to separate from the world, Genesis 1 through 3 and 18 through 22. And he ended his life in shame and never to be heard from again and he left a shameful heritage and influence for his children Genesis 19 30 through 38 this is the end of it besides what it said about Lot and Peter and Peter is just explaining to us about him being a righteous man although he had dead faith and it shows that God said in it, what can separate us from the love of God? See, nothing can separate us, but the, the thing is, we need to make sure that we have our faith in Him. But dead faith is not rewarded faith. Rewarded faith is when your faith has work to go with it. The reward is for the work that we do, not for just believing, but believing to get us to help when we truly believe. But there's no reward for dead faith. Any question or comment? No. <clears throat> see, I see. I mean, let's say you see had two boys. She had one on had a boy, and another had a boy. So what? Did they keep doing it to have a girl? I mean, because you can't multiple. I mean, they had boys. So what? They kept doing the same with it? Getting the daddy drunk? No, nah, that was the end of that. Too. The history of it, the boy that was born. So when the boy was born, they left out the cave? I don't know. No, they didn't leave the cave. Because they were raised there. What's the question you asked? Them? Oh, 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 I don't know. It's not for real. I'm trying to figure out what you're asking. I'm just asking how they get to be, if they had two, if one on had, and she bore a boy. And the other one, boy, boy, how, did, how can they still, how can they still create a seed? Like, I mean, 
How can Moabite be a people? The boys. How can it be a the, the, the boys. They had wives. They got wives. You know, they grew up. They got wives. So they, they grew up and left out of the cave and went and got a wife? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The boys grew up. They got wives. They wives had children. Moab, his children were the Moabites. And the other gentleman, his children were the Ammon, which is called the Ammonite. So he got a wife also. Now, as far as them two daughters, I can't tell you what else that they did, because the scripture stops there. Lot, you hear no more about him. So that lets us know that where he is, he's stuck there. But as far as him being had the riches he once ever had, he died there in that cave. That way he lived his life out there. So wherever the boys, so wherever they went when they left the cave, they just started their own. The, 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 the one, uh, one of the young men named one more. Uh, right, I'm just saying, I, I, can't, I don't know nothing else to say except he's the father of the Moabite. And the other one is the father of the Ammonite. So they like, well, Indian chief then, almost like, left and started their own little thing. They did. What my son did when he went and got his wife, he started having a family. And now him, him and his wife, they got children. So now when he went and got married and got his children, they moved to their house. See, they staying over there. When Moab got his wife, why should they move? This is where the land of the Moabite. So yeah, they left home. This is what they do. They left home and they started their own family. This is where the family comes from. They the head of this, this family. Even up to this day, there's still the Moabites and the Amorites. You know, of course, if not, we're going to get ready to start in chapter 20. Before we get started in chapter 20, we're going to do a uh, Real quick introduction. I love this chapter right here. And I hope that all of us get something out of this chapter to show us how good God is to us even when we do fall. But here Abraham fell back into sin. And this is what these verses, 1 through 18, going to be talking about. How God keeps his people throughout life even through sin. God's pure grace and glorious power carries his people through all the trials of life. This passage is a clear picture of what God means by working all things out for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose, Romans 8 and 28. On the very eye of one of the greatest moments in Abraham's life, the long hoped for a son. He sinned again, sinned terribly, and by his sin, he imperiled and jeopardized the hope. Once again, God was forced to intervene on his behalf. God showed his eternal mercy by keeping and preserving his dear father, even though he, he terribly sinned. Abraham was saved and kept by God and by God alone. God took his initiative to intervene on Abraham's behalf. He showed Abraham and all succeeding generations that it is his grace and his grace alone that continues to save and keep the believer. The believer is shown to be what, is, what he really is, a believer, yes, but a frail, mar, deprived human being. He is but a poor sinner who is saved and kept by God's pure grace and glorious power. Time and again throughout Genesis and the rest of the Bible, God is seen delivering and keeping his servant even through sin. But note that it's not from sin, but through sin. God's servants are shown to be mere men, totally deprived men. As stated, they are seen as frail, moral, and post sinners 
who not only have to be saved, but kept by God's pure grace and glorious power. Why does God deliver and keep his people through sin? When they are deprived and show their depravity by sinning so often? Why does God continue to save believers when they come so short of God's glory? Why does God not just cast us, his people, judge them, erase them from his memory forever? God loves his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, supreme. And God has made one supreme promise to him, that he shall have many adopted brothers and sisters, a family created in the image of God and conformed to the image of Christ. God is saving and keeping a people to praise and honor his son, a people to worship him as, a as the permanent one, the sovereign Lord and majesty of the universe. So God has made this promise to his son that he will have many brothers and sisters who will praise and honor him. He has planned that his son shall have many brothers made in his image, perfect beings, people who have freely chosen to believe and to honor him in this life and to worship and serve him throughout all eternity. His brothers and sisters shall lift his name above all that is, has been, or ever will be. So it's because of the promise that he made to his son is why he keeps us as being, although we fall short, so many times we think, we think messed up. We say things that messed up. We do things that messed up. But we go back to him and we ask forgiveness and he forgive us because of his son and what his son has done for us. It's not that we so good. It's because God loves his son. And remember, this is Genesis. He made the promise in the beginning that when man first sinned that he was going to sin, Jesus being the Savior. This is the one that's going to bruise Satan's head. So guess what? This is what Abraham then was looking forward to. A promise of the promised land, which represents heaven for us, and a promise of the promised seed to come, which has already come, that we can see, and now we have to, we put our trust in him, and God loves his son so much that that's why he continued his grace and mercy for old wretch like me. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. You know, he just keep on forgiving us. I mean, just keep on. You know, we are people. If you keep doing the same thing, uh, you know, it's not even out now. You ain't keep doing it. But God, he's so merciful. He's so loving. He just keep on. You know, that should encourage us. Who wants to serve God? He accepts us with all of our flaws. And then give us a part of him to help us to be more like him. He gave us his self and allowed his self to come and dwell inside of some weak pieces of clay like us. Oh, what great love he has for us. Any question or comment on our introduction before we get into the lesson? Just and we need to keep in mind, Abraham being the father of faith. Every mistake that Abraham has made, we have already made them also. The forgiveness that God has given Abraham through all of this, get what the same forgiveness he gave us. And, he, and the thing about this, see, God knows that Abraham had to learn how to walk by faith. He had to learn how to be obedient in every way. He had to learn that through everything that happened, no matter what it looked like, keep your faith and your trust in God. He had to learn, don't leave out of the promised land for nothing. He had to learn those things. Guess what? 
That's what we are here to do today. We are having to learn. Isn't that what we're here for? Pay attention. That's why we call it Bible. If there are no questions coming, we prepare and we'll start with verse 1 in chapter 20. Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. So here it is, the believer. Abraham sinned. He committed two gross sins that we're going to talk about. Abraham forsake the promised land. It had been 20 years since he had last forsaken the promised land and gone down into Egypt. For 20 years, he had been faithful and remained in the land living in heaven in the plain of Mira, Mara. Remember that Abraham had built an altar at Hebron, which means fellowship or communion with God. Hebron was the place where Abraham had lived and walked with God, prayed and worshipped and matured spiritually. For 20 years, he had been in heaven, fellowshipping and communing with God and faithfully remaining in the promised land. But now, for some reason, he decided to move south to Gerar, the capital of the Philistines. Gerar was near the border of Egypt, was a devastation of the surrounding land with Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed just too desolate for Abraham to remain there. Because remember, now Abraham had herds and he had cattle. But remember, everything in Sodom and Gomorrah and around Sodom and Gomorrah had been destroyed. So what Abraham is looking at now is that it's a desert land there and how he going to feed his flocks and that. So uh, it was a waste, was a wasted sight too great. A reminder of Lot and his tragic end. But Abraham don't know if Lot made it or not. He only know that he prayed for Lot. But he don't know if Lot made it or not. Abraham remember when he got up that morning all he saw was a great smoke coming out and down there like a big furnace. Well Abraham needing new market for his business dealing or uh, for his herd the flock since Sodom and Gomorrah surrounding cities had been destroyed. Scripture does not say why Abraham left the promised land. Perhaps all three possibilities played a part in his move. The area was totally devastated. Abraham had a lapse of faith. He once again failed to trust God to take care of him and left the promised land. True, he did not go all the way back down into Egypt. But he almost did. He went right up to the border of Egypt, to the city of Gerar, the city that was then the prosperous and thriving capital of Philistine. Abraham probably moved to Gerar because it was the capital, the largest market for his business transaction. His faith in God wavered, weakened, and eventually collapsed. He just could not see how he could maintain his business and other holders unless he lived close by a large city. He once again made a decision on his own without God, made a decision based on his own human reasoning. Abraham forsook the promised land, but Abraham was doing what he could see as being his need. I can see ain't, no, ain't nothing for me to raise on. I can see that I need to move to another place. So in his natural mind, because he can see these things, well, what am I going to do? I think I do. I take him down to this, where this big city is. I think I can do more trading there. I can make more money there. I mean, my business will do better there. So what was he going on? What he could see. So God has to teach us how to walk by faith instead of by sight. So instead of him consulting God, we do it all the time. Instead of him consulting God to say, Lord, what would you have me to do? He looked and said, well, I can see I need to move. I can see that it's better down there. I can see 
that my business will do better. I can see that that's the capital now, man. There's a lot of people going in and out. So what were they doing about it? What did he see? So from a natural eye, he was doing the right thing. Can y'all see that? But it's so easy for us to walk in what we can see. But it, just because we can see it don't mean that it's God's will. So even though we can see it, we got to learn how to talk to the Lord first. Oh Lord, I've been, I've been trying to get I've been trying to get this job. At so and so and play, but now so and so and they call me, they gonna pay me more money. I can see, I can do more with my, for my family. I can see that I'll be able to do better. I can see that this gonna help me. But you know what I can't see? What it might cost me to get that money. And brother Forte, think of Forte, I know you said it one time. You got your, what, what you call it, your dream job. My dream job. And it turned into a nightmare. My dream job. <laughs> <laughs> but now what you can see, this is it. I can see it. Do I need to consult God when I can see it? Yes, you do. That's what the Lord is telling us. We can see the prosperity of it. But we can't see the cost of it. There's a cost. You don't know the cost till you get there. And sometimes your best job was a setup. You thought this is it. You don't know it's a setup, but guess what? God, do. when you consult him, it's like, I'm going down there. But Lord, this is the job. No, no, you go down there. But when we don't consult him, what we do? We go right on down there. And then, get what we start doing after we get there. Lord, if you just get me out of this. <laughs> you know, the Lord did come down and talk to each student and looked at him and said, I tell you, brother. Mm -hmm. But, Pastor, I had prayed about that job. And you led me there. And, you know, when I got that job, within three months, I was able to get the house that I had been praying to him for, too. Mm -hmm. But then, boy, it took about three months to really understand everything. And then when I started getting nervous and find out how bad everything was there, I was like, I'm sitting on the time bomb. This thing could blow up in a minute. And then I got mad at the Lord for putting me in that trick bag. I said, Lord, why are you put me in? I wanted to have, but why are you going to put me in where I know I can't stay and keep it? Stayed as long as I could, had to go. And I was still mad at the Lord about me being in that situation. But then, when I saw how things worked out, I had more. I stepped right into another job that I could keep. My money kept coming. <laughs> and I didn't miss a paycheck, didn't miss a mortgage, anything. I only had to take $500 out of my savings for something I wanted, not really needed. And then I stepped into that job and six months into the Navy, and that's when I retired from. So the Lord told me, all you had to do was trust in me. And I felt like, I, mean, I felt like Peter did. When, you know, the Lord had told me, car crows go crows. He brought me right back there and said, see, that's why you trust me. I'll show you the way. I feel like I ain't questioning sin. He leads us in places sometimes that uh, might cost us. Carry us through things. When I say cost us, it cost me something. Sometimes he carries places to suffer. And sometimes, when we pray, we got to go to easy drive. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm going to tell you why I say that. <laughs> the devil easy drive mm -hmm. on your prayer. Because I remember before my accident, and this is going to be 20 years this year, that there was a church that I was about to take. And I had talked to the Lord about it. And I I know that God was directing me there. You want to tell you why I say I know it? Everything that happened 
He lined up with the word of God. But what had happened was, see, the devil, he listened to your prayer. He watched your action. He know it. He also know your heart. The devil did just like he did with Jesus. He brought Jesus scripture. Now when we looked at that, he brought Jesus scripture. Jesus come up with scripture. You know, okay, you want to have scripture? I bring the scripture. But that what he did with me, he brought the scripture. I said, oh yeah, that's it. Yeah, what? That wasn't for me. And it took God, took me in an accident to keep me out of that house. To show me this is not what I have for you. My wife was with me. The way that that thing went down, it was one of them Moses and Joshua did. I know this God. We done went through it. I mean, this is scripture. Oh, yeah, this is God. But you see, sometimes the devil here, he over here, he's proud now. So that's why we have to make sure that we stay careful. Now, but one other thing. Although the devil can overhear your prayer and the devil can sometimes intervene and get you in place, that's when you said, but God, he'll bring you right out and put you where he wants you to be. God will do that. So this is why it's so important for us as believers to make sure that everything that we do, that we put God first and, and we check with him and make sure that what he wants to do. So now watch this thing. Even when we are misled, led by that old servant, Oh, he knows scripture. God knows our heart. He's not going to let us stay in that place we've been misled. He's going to move us to where he wants us to be. And we just stay with him. So don't think one time that old liar. Don't you know if he in disguise himself to look like Christ? He don't mind disguising himself. And, and he in our prayers, you say you want it. Oh, okay, well then let me set you up here. So we got to make sure that we stay with the Lord because even if the devil pull us off track, God will pull us back. He'll pull us back. Any other questions or comments? If not, we'll go to verse 2. And Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Amalek, king of the Lord, sent and took Sarah. Mm -hmm. There you go out again. This ain't the first time he done lied like that. This seems like Abraham get on some pressure where he think his life on the line. You know, <laughs> you know what? Why do you think the devil come to us and he'll threaten us with that right there? Your life. Well, your life on the line. <laughs> Abraham, Abraham is deceived and lied to us. One sin always leads to another sin. Having left the promised land for a strange country, Abraham began to fear for his own personal safety. He allowed thoughts of doubt and evil to enter his mind. We need to say that again. Why? What do you think they'll attack you in? In your mind. Where do we bring doubt about things? In your mind. Where do we make a suggestion? In your mind. What do you think he make you see stuff that ain't even there in your mind? And you know what? He'll attack that mind and make it seem like it is so clear. And that's what happened. No, it's in your mind. Would the, would the nobleman and the king of Gura hear him in order to take Sarah his wife and take her as their wife? Was it God's will for him to leave Herod? To move to the land of the Philistines, to their capital, should he have remained in here trusting God to help him? If he had made a mistake, would God help him now? Abraham lied, claimed that Sarah was his sister, not his wife. And Abimelech, the king, took Sarah to himself. Abimelech was a title for the ruler not a personal name. Abraham acted selfishly, putting his own, putting his own safety free and risking the safety, honor, and purity of his wife Sarah. He was willing for her to be sexually abused, to commit adultery, and to be in danger if she displeased the man, all to save his own neck. Sarah was pregnant at this time, pregnant with the promised son Isaac. Abraham's sin was great indeed. 
just unbelievable at this stage of his life and spiritual maturity. Sinning when the most important event of his life was about to take place, the birth of the promised son, if he was endangering the very purpose and will of God to send the promised seed to earth, endangering the very life of Sarah and the child within her. We must never forget who God is, never forget his omnipotence, his unlimited power to help us. We must never stop seeking the promised land of heaven, no matter how great a trial confront us, we must never cave in and leave the promised land. We must not backslide. God will help us and look after us if we will only trust him. No matter what happens in your life, do not turn around and go back to Egypt. The devil tell you, you might as well to quit. Can't you see you keep falling down? You keep messing up. You did this. You did that. Why don't you just quit? That's what the devil brings to your mind. And you know what? If we are not strong, we'll start looking around and we'll say, man, I might as well quit. I can't do that right. Then the other guy. When you start thinking like that, guess what he's going to do now? Oh. Yeah, you're so right. You can't do nothing right. Let me tell you the stuff you ain't did right. Mm. You did it. Now you're going to go bring up you did it. Mm. You ain't. I mean, and the most stuff he brings up, the weaker you get. And the next thing, you might as well quit. Why do you think people kill themselves? They'll get in the head. I'm quit like you, might as well, you might as well kill yourself. No. No, 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 no. You better think about this. Listen, when you're going through suffering, and that pain in your heart is unbearable, and you don't know and lean on God, the devil tell you how to relieve your pressure to just end it all. That's what he said. <laughs> just end it all. And guess what? We start to think of ending, you know, and if we're not strong, I just ain't got the nerve to shoot myself in the head. But I'm gonna get these ball of sleeping pills, and I'm just gonna go to sleep, and I just won't ever wake up, and I'm just gonna end it all. No, you're not ending it all. You are actually beginning. It all. The beginning of eternity is when we leave here. So you are not ending it. You are beginning it. And when you, you if you wake up in hell, you'll be like, man, I, I, give me some more pain, Lord, and just let me go back up in hell. You can put anything you want on me. Lord, I'm my suffering for the rest of my life. Take care of me. I'm dying in hell. Lord, I just can't take it. But again, what? And you can thank for an eternity if I had not. But you can't take it back. That God has told us that he has never put no more on us than we can bear. God is a God that knows more about us because he created us and we know about ourselves. Everything that comes upon you is going to be tailor made Whatever comes up on me is going to be tailor-made for me. And the reason he tailor-made them because he knows our limits. And he knows them better than we do. And most of the time, we don't go to our limit. We go to our time. That's what we get to. So, I ain't no limit, man. I'm tired of this. I, ain't got, I, I just ain't got to put up with this. I ain't got to go through this. I ain't got to do this. I ain't got, I ain't got, I ain't got, I ain't got, we get to sing a song, but I, I ain't got, I don't have to. <laughs> no, no, <I'm> must. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> we gonna stop right there, cause <laughs> 
We're going to stop there. Let's stop. Praise the Lord. Amen. This way, it had to be tough to be a woman. Now, they gave up their women easy. But you know what? The God was pleased with self. Yes. God dedicated a whole chapter just to a self. That was a good one. Mm -hmm. You see, when a woman will put up with you and your weaknesses, but yet they stay there. You don't think it went through her mind? This man ain't gonna put me out here like this. Everything. Now watch this. See, this is what the Bible didn't say to her. We don't, we don't have the proof of it. But I can, I just cannot not believe. Sarah was put into them situations by the weakness of a husband that called her, that called on God to protect her. That's why God dedicated a whole chapter to Sarah. That's a woman of women. Yes. 